Okay, we're um, handing over to Tudor, who's going to be talking about um, document and quantify in formal learning. All right. Is this working? Great. Um, so I assume if you are here, you are really into podcasting, which is fun because you already had a talk in the morning all about podcasting, or you are really into humanities, social science, education, and you organize workshops or different learning activities in your makerspace, hackerspace, fab lab, or any community initiative. And the, the reason I'm here is because of an event like this. Who can recognize this event from the picture? Yeah, so it's a CC Camp 2015 that was organized in Germany, close to Berlin. Um, and the reason I was there, and the reason I'm here today is kind of a loop back to celebrate those in the community that invest extra time next to everything they do, to also take the role and teach, pass the knowledge, pass the skills, and particularly one person that is very dear to my heart, and you can find him at the Belgian embassy, at the hardware tent, Mitch Altman from Noisebridge, San Francisco. So it was because of him that I got to know the maker scene, and also later get um, dive deeper into the fab uh, community and the maker spaces all across different countries. And what started at the beginning as a journey to build a software for maker spaces, that's what I started with, ended up with a project uh, that is focused on education, and specifically a podcast that tries to find those rebels and scientists and makers who challenge the status quo, the schooling system, and build something new. And this is what we do at Experiment Q. We started a few months ago, traveled to a couple of countries, and met people that we think are interesting to organize one hour plus conversations with them and have like an intimate conversation about their motivation, why they do the work they do, what's their vision of learning and education in the future, both in their small community, like a maker space or a school, but at a country or region level. And the, the key question that drives our work at Experiment Q is really this. So how do humans learn? And we don't mean the neuroscience, although we cover this, you know, what are the best processes, how to set up the school, what kind of environment to use, colors, sound, uh, how to keep attention, and so on. The, the real focus here is how to set up the social context and to embed parents and the community and the government to set up the right environment for people to learn at any age. And I figured, since we do podcasting, and I love questions, specifically those moments that you sit in front of your guest and you see that they were never asked this question before, or you encourage that aha moment, or you make them laugh, or sometimes make someone cry, that's kind of an intellectual orgasm or a challenge that is really exciting to pursue. And that's why today here I bring questions. There will be a small Q&A at the end if you want to ask your questions, but I want to pass some questions that I learned from our interviews. And I want to wrap them into stories. So four stories, four questions into four stories that we'll learn from the podcast. And for this, I will need to get my, so to speak, uh, suit. That's how I go to work. That's how I interview people. And um, at the end of every episode, the guest gets to write a message on this code that I, I don't wash. It's, it's OK. And it's a collection of stories from the people that we interview. Their views about education and what their work is all about. And I also picked these words because they are somehow in the media, except one, which is neat. Um, and, and we talk about them, but in a different context. So let's start with the first. Emigrants. 
let's build walls, separate people, get out of the community and all these talks. So I am an immigrant. And although I came from Amsterdam today, and that's where I lived since few months and years because I moved in and out, I was born in Moldova, a small country that was part of the Soviet Union, and you had the talk about zeal and all that stuff. Now it's a, it's a follow-up of that, but focused on the social and economic aspect. So after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, the economy and the ruble, a lot of people left the country. So what, was, what remained were kids who stayed with their grandparents or relatives and kind of did a peer-to-peer -peer education. So this is me when I was, I don't know, five or six with my cousin, and we lived with our grandparents. And this is a later picture that I took at the Meta Lab in uh, Vienna. It's a hacker space in Vienna, Austria. And what I want to share with that, that along the journey of being an immigrant and living in a couple of countries and meeting other immigrants from all around the world, what I learned is that it's all about the context. And if you choose, if they, have the, if they had the chance to build something in their country, they would stay because they have the advantage of language, of connections, and so on. But they left to look for better opportunities. And they, they in some sense, are also hackers. They look at the, how a country works, how they can get a job, how can they learn the language quickly, how can they provide for their family, and they, then they go and, and do it. And so the question when it comes to building learning experiences, and I've seen a lot of maker spaces and fab labs being kind of this nest for diversity and people from different countries coming together and working on projects. The question when someone designs a workshop or a learning experience is really this. What is the game about? What is the larger picture? When you design a workshop, even if it's Arduino or soldering, or you go out and, and build a robot, what's, what's the game that you play? What are the rules? What are the different levels? How do you relate to what they know already in the past? And how do you give them some follow-up actions or a call to action after your workshop? And this is something that we learn through the interviews that those who design curriculums and different learning experiences never really think only about their one hour or half an hour. It's always the context. Where do people come from and where do they go? And how do you facilitate that transition, that game that you play with them? The second word is DIY, do it yourself. And here I want to tell a bit also my story and link to makerspaces and how I really discovered makerspaces. So this is me in 2011. Um, I'm a village boy, so I left to the capital city to get college degree. And the system is a bit weird because you get college, but then you need to go and have your university studies. But I dropped out immediately after um, the college because during my college, I got into all these organizations, like student organizations. We organized events, conferences, different stuff, and got really excited. And I understood that the world is way bigger than my village, my city, and then my country. So I quit. I dropped out. I moved out of the country. Uh, first in Romania to build an uh, underground label for street artists and musicians who were doing really cool stuff. Then I moved to Austria. The second picture is a sugar factory in which I lived for about six months, and we worked on some really cool uh, social projects with a great community from uh, Vienna, but also from the around Burgland, Eisenstadt, who is from Austria, maybe knows the, the cities. The third is from a hacker trip to China uh, that Mitch Altman organizes every year. It takes about 20 people to different manufacturing facilities, and they learn how China works and how the economy and the hardware work. And the fourth picture is really what got me into spaces like this and events like this. This is from, uh, I believe it's from Resistor, which is a makerspace, hackerspace in New York City. Uh, when I did a three months um, couch surfing experience through the States, first in 
San Francisco, then in New York and in Boston. And what I did, I stayed in maker spaces and I worked on hobby projects. But my real interest back then was uh, I tried to get into the community by building a software for maker spaces, which we call them uh, a GitHub for hardware, so a version control system for hardware. And we got interest and we got um, money to build it, including an accelerator and all that stuff. And after we had the prototype, we figured we need to go out there back into the community and talk to makerspaces, see if, how they work, if they will ever need it or not. We were supposed to go way earlier, but we took some time together and the project failed. But what, uh, what I learned, and by the way, on the right, that's a, uh, a map using SafeCast. So we put a Geiger counter from SafeCast team, uh, which they built after the Fukushima earthquake in Japan. So basically it's a device that measures radiation and you put it on your car and you drive around. So as we went from maker spaces to, from one city to another, we also put it on our car and we collected data that we gave back to the community. So the software that we built failed, but what I learned in the process is the amazing potential that these spaces have in terms of building learning experiences for people. So the whole component of education and learning within Fab Labs, maker spaces, hub, hacker spaces has amazing value and some of the best innovative projects that I've seen happen in these spaces outside the government curriculum, outside pedagogy and super scientific stuff. So the question here, and by the way, um, this is a book that I, I recommend to a lot of people in, in, in the community. It's a very simple one. It it's, uh, has a bunch of illustrations and funny anecdotes about how to document your work and share it with the community in a way that is it's fun and makes it rewarding. And I know that documentation is a big struggle for a lot of people, so this hopefully helps. And because of this work, I got to Paris. And there is a research center called uh, Center for Research and Interdisciplinarity. Basically, it's a bunch of hackers and PhD uh, people who got into the French government and convinced them, along with other foundations, to put a lot of money into basically changing the system from within. So what they did is they, they have something called blank diploma. So you join their uh, bachelor or master, and officially you, you have all these courses and you get a diploma, but inside they allow you to create your own diploma. And this pretty much is already done in a lot of maker spaces through open badges or courses and so on. So I went back to the community and I asked help from different people how to design my own curriculum. But there is a problem. If you paid attention, I dropped out of the university. I didn't have a bachelor degree. And turns out in France and in a couple of other countries, I think also in Netherlands and Canada, there is a law that is roughly translated as validation of life experience. It was done, created initially for adults to validate experiences that are different from their diploma. But then they extended it to younger people because they said, you have many reasons to drop out of schools. You don't know what you want to do with your life. You don't have money. You don't have motivation, so you quit. But maybe later you want to get back and, and have your degree or learn. So they open up the possibility. So that's what I did. And basically I skipped the bachelor. I went into a master degree and I focused on this question. How do we document what people learn? And this leads me to the second question, which is when designing a learning experience and now, especially now as we have as we have MOOCs and we have all the knowledge available on, on the internet, we assume that everyone can go, everyone can go and just create their own education. But if we don't pay attention to the set of values that these people have, or they're not facilitated, or they're not helped via you know, community spaces and so on, then we might have troubles. And that's what I had. They just gave me the freedom to design my own curriculum, but I didn't have guidance 
to do it. And I can share more in, uh, in a moment. And here is an example that this already ha happens. So maker spaces and hacker spaces already have uh, different sets of values that they share. And this is one as the design principles from hacker spaces. Now, neat. This is something I want to mention briefly, although I'm almost out of time. This, for some people, may sound very similar, like the Russian niet, which, which uh, you know, a Russian gentleman says to the importers of French or uh, Dutch cheese because of European sanctions. Sorry, because I mentioned the cheese. I live both in France and in Netherlands, and cheese seems to be the common denominator. Um, this stands for something else. So it's people that are not in education or employment or training to get employment. So basically people between the age 20 and 35 who do nothing. Some of them have double degrees, and these are some of the statistics for, for Europe. In some countries like Italy, they're close to 30% of young people in this age who basically do nothing. They don't have opportunities, they cannot go out there and they are unemployed and basically the government cannot support them. If we move on, this is not just Europe. In India, the country needs to create around 22 million jobs every year to support the demand of youth, to give them opportunities, yet it creates only 1 million. 19 million, what do they do? Similar in Lebanon, where we build a learning program that looks like a startup accelerator, but behind we really measure everything we can from the application process, from the way they work, the way they present in the end, and show competencies and profiles beyond just degrees to show what young people are capable of and what they can do, but yet we touch only a tiny percentage of what the country needs. And if you read some of these books, you may find a bit of optimism like, hey, of course we'll have automation, uh, but we'll distribute people to, or reskill people to other places, and then we'll be fine. It already happened in Industrial Revolution, it already happened in 30s, people will be reskilled and will we'll find a way out. And of course there are problems, which means we have plenty of work for everyone all around the world. The question here is, how do we define success in this new context when we have automation, unemployment, and people, young people with double degrees sometimes that don't have working opportunities? So how do we define success when we design new learning experiences? And data. And here I will skip to just a few examples that I want to mention. Right now, when we think about learning credentials, we think about CVs, grades, LinkedIn portfolios, maybe letters of recommendations. But if, we, if you ask someone, for example, to put it in contracts, if you ask someone about a project, they'll probably bring a dashboard and show all kinds of data about the state of their project, if they are late, if they are on time, what are the inputs, outputs, costs, budgets. If you ask a person about their learning, the state of their learning, what they know, how they learn, what's the most frequent discipline, they'll probably, besides those CVs and LinkedIn stuff, cannot show much. And especially here, it's a really interesting population, which is elderly people who have experience, also young people who learn outside the system who have experience, how do we credit that and give it to other people? And here are some of the experiments that we've done back in Paris and also now, and I can talk if you have some questions or later on you find me at the hardware tent. Um, one that is particularly interesting is the digital certificates by MIT, which basically is taking the open badge model and putting it on a blockchain. So every time you earn a badge from an institution, it's kept there and it's validated so you can have your own collection of badges and, and share it with the world. This um, is Fab Academy who creates a, a skill accelerator, basically also a blockchain wallet with skills that you can trade uh, in between different fab labs and you can take with you. This is really interesting and I'm trying to say it briefly. So the French government last year uh, was debating or discussing 
an idea to introduce a national citizen education number. So a number that is similar or maybe different than your social security number where you can store all your learning credentials. And some of the money that is given to the schools can be given to the individual directly to manage their own education. There are also critics to this because you can use it um, against people who, you give people money, you say, okay, you, you can use them to educate yourself, but then if you're not employed after certain months or weeks, that's your problem. Uh, because we, we see the data that you, you took the course or how you did and so on. And actually it's coming in, in contrast with another idea from 72 from Ivan Ilyich, which basically advocated for edu credit cards. Every citizen has a credit card, the government puts directly money on that card, and every individual chooses how to organize their own education. So that's kind of interesting. And I will leave you with some questions for the end that are really unanswered when, uh, don't have an answer when it comes to the future of learning or education. First, Everyone talks about like micro-credentials, documenting what you learn every day, but the real question is what for? Right now, people, when they lose a job, they get quickly into learning something so they can up their skill level. Once they get the job, it's finished. They stop. Um, how do we credit the skills at the mass level without breaching the privacy of people? So right now, we believe that the knowledge of humanity equals all the content that is out there online, in books, studies, papers, so on. But it doesn't really reflect the level of competences and skills that people have, and how can we trade those skills on a daily basis. And finally, how do we trade the skills and the competences of people that don't have access to a laptop or a phone on a daily basis? So these are some of the questions that I wanted to leave you with, and I used my time, so 20 minutes, um, I don't know, guys, if we still have any option for time. Okay, thank you. We do have time for questions, so if anyone has one, throw your arm up. Any questions? All right, if anyone wants to talk education, I'll be at the hardware tent uh, at the Belgian embassy. Thank okay, you. thank you very much.